All right. Well, welcome to all of you present. Finally, after so many months, again in the SMB room, really missing it. Um, and of course, uh, uh, welcome to the people at home that are uh, listening to uh, to our uh, meeting. Um, together with uh, Pivot Park and um, um, Health Valley, we have organized uh, with Science Beach Business Brisker this meeting. Um, of course, we hear a lot of news, a lot of bad news, difficult news around uh, COVID and Corona and everything what goes on. But we have seen that also there are a lot of new developments and new ideas. So this afternoon, we have a kind of uh, highlights several presentations uh, because of the number of presentations the presentations in itself are, uh, are a bit short but i'm sure there's going to be a lot of interesting uh, information i'm gonna uh, end with a small uh, panel discussion before i forget for the people uh, at home they can uh, ask their questions to the chat function and um, over here i will be in contact with kim who uh, when I ask, hey, are there any questions? And she will, she will, trans, she will translate or tell the, the questions for you. It's going to be limited time for, for discussions, but we're going to try it uh, anyhow. So let's start with the first uh, presentation. Okay. Oh, it's just, I'll start again. Start again. So again, we're going. To, no, I'm not going to start again. So this is the uh, the overview of the presentations, um, and I propose we start up uh, with the, with the first one and ask uh, Professor Yanya Teya to come over here and give his presentation. Yep, Thank you very much. Yeah, you uh, how do I get my presentation? Mm. Oh, sorry. It's just oh yeah. Okay. Hey, that's easy. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to share with you some of our work, in which we which we started actually a couple of years ago, but we continued also during this year, and and I will show you some data from the first um, the first part of this year as well. And our work has focused on vaccinations in general, and I will start with some historical uh, aspects. Uh, we are working with Bacille calmet geren which is uh, the vaccine against uh, tuberculosis. It's a mycobacterium bovis, which can protect uh, young children and also a little bit less the adults against uh, severe forms of tuberculosis. And what is very interesting, what it has been observed about, about BCG is that at the moment that BCG was introduced in the population, and this is one of the first studies in the 1930s, last uh, century, in Sweden, people have observed that it's not only TB which is reduced by BCG, but overall mortality decreased by more than 50% in the children who got the BCG. This is before the time of antibiotics, when 11% of the children died of an infection in their first four years of life. And this was reduced to 4% after introduction of, TB, of uh, BCG. And this was not due to the TB deaths, because those were responsible only for less than half of a percent of deaths in this uh, category of children. So we were asking ourselves, so this epidemiological observation has been made many times when BCG was introduced in different countries, in European countries, in the United States, and thereafter in, Af in Africa. And we were asking ourselves, would it be possible that indeed BCG can protect us also against other types of infections, heterologous infections, not only against TB? And for that, a couple of years ago, we have done a proof of principle trial in which we used a model of human infection. And of course, it's tough to infect somebody, but what you can do is give a second vaccination with a live attenuated microorganism which is a sort of a mild infection. And this is, for example, yellow fever vaccine. Yellow fever vaccine, vaccine is an attenuated virus, gives you a very mild infection that you don't even feel most of the time, but you can follow it in the blood by doing a PCR. So you count basically the number of uh, virus particles in the blood. And what we have done, we have 
taken one group of individuals, we gave them placebo, another group we gave them BCG, and one month later everybody got the yellow fever vaccine. And then we did PCR in the blood at three time points and on day three, five, and seven to count the virus particles in the blood. And on day three and seven, the viremia was very low because here it was just starting to go up and here it was eliminated, which is normal. But on day five, most of the people had uh, viruses in the blood. And what we observed that the people who got the BCG one month before had very significantly less viruses than those who received placebo. This is a logarithmic scale, as you can observe here. And this was associated with a normal response to yellow fever vaccine. So this observation, this uh, proof of principle clinical trial demonstrated us that BCG indeed can induce a general boosting of the immune response and that can induce protection against a viral infection, a non-specific mild viral infection. And the question is, how does it work? And the host defense has two components. It has the innate host defense and adaptive host defense. Innate is what is happening in the first couple of minutes and hours after an infection. These are monocytes and macrophages, mm -hmm. uh, uh, leukocytes, which come to the site of the infection. They engulf and kill the pathogens, basically. Very simple set. And they eliminate 99.9% .9 of the infections that we get every day, basically. We don't even feel about that. Every time that we inhale, we inhale also bacteria. They come in contact, for example, with alveolar macrophages. They just ingest the bacteria, kill them, and that's it. However, in a very small percentage of cases, when we inhale a very dangerous pathogen or we inhale a, or ingest a lot or we get a, a, a severe cut, let's say, or whatever, which gets infected, then the infections goes on, cannot be eliminated by the innate immune response, and then we have adaptive immune uh, cells, such as lymphocytes, which produce antibodies, which are very specific in recognizing the pathogen, and they come into place. They multiply, they become millions from, from one, uh, there is clonal expansion, and so on. And these cells actually build an immunological memory there after of that pathogen. That's why we get, we get measles or, 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 or varicella, for example, only once in our lifetime because we build immunological memory. And this is exactly what any type of vaccine is trying to do. Also, people now trying to build a COVID-19 vaccine, they are trying to build TMB cells, memory TMB cells, which can produce antibodies against the virus and which can produce specific T cells which can kill the infected cells. However, this could not explain what we have observed with BCG because this is a very specific process. If you build a B cell memory to make antibodies that is specific for one pathogen, you cannot inject against, uh, with a specific vaccine against COVID-19 and protect against tuberculosis. That is not possible through TMB cells. But we do see this very broad protection when we use BCG. So how can that be explained? And what we and I'm just jumping now several years of research, and what we have observed is the following. These cells here, which are innate immune cells, they are also changed. They are also building a sort of immunological memory. But it's very different from the immunological memory that it's built in, in the T cells, T cells and B cells, in the lymphocytes. What is happening exactly? When we have a naive monocyte and macrophage, these are innate immune cells. This is not producing any, uh, any proteins which are necessary for host defense. Gene transcription is very low. Basically, the chromatin in the nucleus of this, of this gene is very, very tightly packaged. So the transcription cannot take place. Transcription factor cannot bind to the DNA and so on. When we get an infection, there are chemical transformation in the nucleus of the cells. is acetylation and methylation of certain proteins from the nucleus histones and they open the chromatin, they open the DNA, so it can be, can be read much easier by the transcription factor. It's like reading the instructions, how to make something which is necessary against infection. You open the book, you read the instructions, and then what you do, you close the book when you don't need it anymore, because it's tough to go around with an open book. However, what we have observed, and always we thought everything goes back precisely to the same, uh, to the same uh, cell, to the same normal list. But what we have observed is that some of this chemical modification stay at that place. It's like a bookmark is put at the right places in the DNA. 
So the next time when you have an infection, you can open the book and read it much easier. You can come to the right place much easier. And that's exactly what is happening. When secondary infection is coming, actually the DNA opens at the right places much quicker and much more efficient. So the host defense is activated better. And this is exactly what we are trying now actually to, to apply in COVID-19 with large BCG trials. The concept behind this is that in somebody who's not, not vaccinated, there is a low innate immune response. For the cells, it's difficult to recognize this new virus. The, the virus will get the chance to multiply. We will have high viremia in the circulation in some individuals. There will be hyperinflammation because of these high numbers of viruses, a lot of symptoms, high severity of the disease, and some people die. However, what we try to do is vaccinate these people boost their innate immune responses, which blocks the viremia. The virus can, does not get the chance to multiply in high numbers. We'll have low systemic inflammation, low collateral damage of this, of this response, and the patient will survive. And I will just give you the results of the first study that we just published in which we try to protect elderly against severe infections. And we got uh, 200 elderly with comorbidities, half of them BCG, half of them placebo, and we followed them up for one year. And this was started before the COVID-19. And after the one year observation, what we observed actually is that there are 40% less infections in the elderly who got the BCG. And when we look exactly what type of infections do they have less, <clears throat> abdominal infections or urinary tract infections are not different but all these elderly get 80% less respiratory tract infections compared with the non-vaccinated individuals. And using this approach, we propose, and large studies are now ongoing, more than 15 of them around the world, in which BCG is used as a bridging vaccine, in which we boost very broadly the, the host defense against the virus, so we win some time to develop the, the proper uh, um, specific vaccine and vaccinate there after the people because the disadvantage of this approach is that the protection is probably only good for two or three years it cannot protect us for the rest of our life but for two or three years is enough exactly what we need to produce a new vaccine now using these effects of bcg i will shift in the last three or four minutes to how we learned how bcg is working and trying to use that knowledge in producing new medicine new drugs, basically. So we asked ourselves, which is the component of the, in the BCG which induces this boosting of the immune response, this increase in the, in the host defense mechanisms? Because we knew from old studies that BCG can be used also in cancer, but not effective enough. For example, in bladder cancer, people give installations with BCG in the, intravesically, the bladder, and that, uh, that is used as a form of immunotherapy. But in other types of cancer, you cannot do that. So we asked ourselves, which is the component of the BCG which does this job? And can we make a, a, a drug out of it? So these are all the components of the cell wall of the BCG. And we started and we looked one by one which one is, is important for inducing these effects. And I spare you all the experiments and tell you that it's the peptidoglycans which is doing this job. And especially a component of the peptidoglycan, which has a, a small component of it, which is called muramil dipeptide. And this muramil dipeptide, thereafter, we incorporated it in nanoparticles that we teamed with, with colleagues from Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. They had a very nice uh, nanoparticle um, uh, technology that can use nanoparticles as carrier for certain drugs. And the nanoparticles that they use are HDL, high density lipoproteins, which we all have in the blood. So they have, it's a natural product, has product which has no side effect. So what we did, what they did basically, uh, we asked them and we, uh, we started this collaboration. They take the HDL and then they decorate it on the surface with muramil D-peptide and muramil tripeptide, which are these components from, uh, from BCG, which boosts the immune system. And we built that, we showed that this is inducing trained immunity. This is also targeting the immune cells. It's going very strongly to the bone marrow where all the immune cell progenitors are, uh, are, uh, are located. And thereafter, we, uh, we use that 
to try to treat a, a severe cancer. And this is a B16 melanoma, which is very difficult to treat. And just to show you, uh, um, in the, at the moment that, that we start to treat the mouse seven days after inoculation of the, of, the, of the tumor, which grows very quickly, we see a dose-dependent response in decreasing the growth of the tumor by using this nanoparticle, which induces um, frame immunity. What we also have, have done thereafter, we showed that this, uh, that this effect is due to stimulation of, uh, of um, myeloid cells, because using a mouse which does not have uh, lymphocytes, uh, the nanoparticles still work. But thereafter, we thought, well, now we have something which stimulates the anti-cancer effect of myeloid cells, of innate immune cells. What if we combine with a current immunotherapy in cancer, which boosts the function of the lymphocytes? And do we get a synergistic effect? And that is exactly what we observed. This is the normal growth of the tumor in the mice. This is what the current immunotherapy that is, is used in the clinic, so the anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4 is doing. This is a combination. Actually, they don't work properly in this model. They are not good enough. When we give the nanoparticle, we, we start to see the decrease in the growth of the tumor. But when we combine the trained immunity therapy with checkpoint in inhibitors, we very strongly and synergistically inhibit the tumor. And actually, four of the 10 mice in these experiments were completely free of cancer. So we are now trying to, to develop this methodology to increase uh, uh, the production, to do it GMP and so on, to be able to go into the direction of, of human studies and treatment of cancer. So what I wanted to show you is that we learned that BCG vaccination has broad effects that can protect against other types of infections. I showed you that this is, can lead to protection of elderly who are susceptible to infections uh, to be protected against this type of infections. And at the same time, we can learn from this, how can we boost the immune system and build new therapies for cancer. And finally, I would like to thank uh, the people who helped us in doing all these studies. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you excellent piece of science as always and nice presentation. Is there um, it's time for one quick question? Not okay. No? Okay, let's let's go on. Thank you very much. So we'll go on to the next uh, presentation. A little help and cleaning. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Yeah, should be okay. Yeah, should be okay. Yeah, just wait. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, let me introduce um, our company for a second here. Um, and I'll uh, talk a little bit more about what we do in, in uh, COVID vaccine development as an example. Um, so we, the company is called Sadar. Uh, what we do is called biosimulation. We build computer models of what you observe in clinical trials, preclinical trials to simulate out the next trial to then uh, use that package to get drugs registered and, and get access to the market. We're a consulting company, we're not a CRO, sort of think of us as the McKinsey of, of uh, biosimulation. We, we are a rather large company with about 850 people. Um, and over the years, uh, we've, we've helped many companies get their registration and market access. There's about 1,600 active clients at the moment. Um, a little bit of my own background, so scientist by training, grew up in, in Big Pharma over the years and then joined Satara, um, helped to grow uh, the company, built divisions, etc. had the responsibility for those, those divisions and of late I've been focusing more on our new growth areas, meaning anything we never get to because we're too busy, things like our APAC market, things like uh, opportunities within COVID, think uh, also about key account management and, and our largest clients. So let's talk a little bit about biosimulation. Um, the analogy here is with airplanes. There's no airplane that goes into the sky without all the nuts and bolts and things of an airplane simulated in the computer first. Literally, you would not have the airplane take off. And the same thing holds true with, with uh, in drug development. There's a lot that you can measure in, in the initial trials. There's a lot that you know from the biology. There's a lot that you measure in preclinical experiments. Then what you think the biology is, what you think 
how the relationships are between drug exposure and the clinical outcome effects, safety, etc. You build computer models for that and you simulate that. And, and so before you do any trial, you do it a thousand times in the computer. You fail a thousand times in the computer to know what not to do to then get it right in the clinical trials. And so we built these, these mathematical constructs in the computer. Um, it co covers everything from human biology to uh, drug behavior and disease. We simulate virtual patient populations. We can ask ourselves these questions. So how does the drug exactly work? What's the mechanism of action here? What can you measure of that mechanism of action? So what's a good biomarker? And how is that related to clinical outcome? Um, you can also ask yourself questions, well, would that be different for patient populations? I mean, we obviously know that children are not, not many adults, so scaling down on the physiology, scaling down on the biology, which may be different as well, um, are, are very typical questions that we answer. Um, and then, how do you prevent and cure diseases? I think we're, we're going into a new stage now with these gene therapies that all of a sudden from small molecules to biologics to complex biology, uh, solutions that are, are very different and, and the questions that are raised are very different as well, very different with risk benefit profiles and, and so in the argumentation with, with the FDA and the AMA um, discussions are very different because of that and, and again a lot of modeling helps to support that. I think part of what we're trying to discuss today is also sort of the commercial angle and, and so COVID um, could be to disruption uh, I must say We've done rather well, and um, that's because our people, they need a laptop, and that's about it. So uh, we didn't really get much disruption in the way we work. We also seen that there was a lot of opportunity with uh, COVID itself. That sounds a little negative, but the way we think about it as well, we've got all these, these really wonderful tools that we can use. We really need to apply this to this world crisis as well, and, and that's what we've been pushing for. And I'll show a few examples of how we apply that. Uh, by repurposing technologies, repurposing things that we already built over the years and thought, hmm, if we use it this way, it may be very useful. And as a result, we now have over about 20 companies that we work for. There's a few logos here that we can share. Um, I'll call out the COVID-19 Therapeutics Accelerator. This is a very large collaboration with the Gates Foundation, and we're basically their modeling and simulation department. And Gates has been our largest client over the years anyway. Um, so good to see that tick up in work. The other part of what we do is much on the disruption of the non-COVID indications. All those trials that have slowed down, patients have dropped out, incomplete information, holding a simulation actually allows you to make some proper inference from those trials. So let's talk a little bit about vaccines. No doubt the best therapeutic um, intervention that we have as, as humanity and most successful uh, of everything we've done. But it doesn't mean we always get it right. You know, let's take the example of, of the regular flu uh, seasonal uh, uh, vaccine. Um, sometimes the flu itself is more virulent in, in, in certain years. Sometimes the vaccine is a little less good at, at instigating this immunogenic uh, genetic response to then actually protect people. And, and that's why you have bad flu years and good flu years. And, and the difference could be several fold in the number of, of deaths uh, throughout those years. So if we look at vaccine development, there's a whole series of questions. And so at the end of the day, we want to know how we prevent future outbreaks and pandemics, herd immunity, revaccination. Those are the questions at the very end. But going along the way of, of the drug development, the vaccine development, there's a series of other questions as well. Uh, a lot of it is centered around the dose that you pick. How often do you do you dose? Um, are there differences between the different populations? How quickly do you get protection in individuals? Um, and then also questions on, you know, how do you scale it up? How do you distribute it? Um, uh, what's the pricing and access? These things are going to be very relevant questions going forward. Personal opinion, you know, there's no point in, in vaccinating the Western world if the rest of the world has no access and, and is a large pool of where the virus still remains because it will just come back. So we need to think about all of that stuff as well. And a lot of that can be done through modeling. You want to simulate first how to do it before you run the experiment and as one in real life. There's a lot of failure in phase three. I think today in the newspaper again, uh, I think it was Janssen said like nine out of 10 will fail in phase three. The good news is there's a lot of phase three at the moment of vaccine, so one or a few will go through, but we have to be realistic. Um, and every time when we hear people saying a vaccine will be available early in 2021, if we're successful, 
and that last little thing is always said but nobody realizes it we always fail let's just talk about that and, and that's the part where we try to help as well good news is there's a lot in development and, and i think i grabbed this data the 16th of september no doubt there's, there's more vaccine candidates in there there's quite a few in, in phase three. There's a few with, with limited approval. I guess we all know the stories about how well those were tested. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the big ones in phase three, they're very promising. But there are some additional questions, I think, that, that we should ask ourselves. So which vaccines is best for whom? Um, we know that immune systems are different between people. And so the immune response that you elicit through a vaccine may be very different in elderly, may be different in children. Um, and so the question is, would they actually need a different dose? Um, also, we'll have a whole series of vaccines coming towards us, which is the best one. None of them are tested head to head. They're all tested in slightly different populations in different places. So let's click, uh, double click on those two examples here for a second. One thing we do is we create uh, what we call clinical outcomes databases. We have AI tools, machine learning. We use that and we go out in the literature and we collect all clinical trials and indication. So take diabetes. We have over, I think it's over 1,250 clinical trials, more than a million patients. And we literally go into the publications. We scrape out the information and we get the time courses of response on the biomarkers, on the clinical outcome. And we create these highly curated databases from that. And that allows us to do all sorts of modeling and simulation on those databases, asking ourselves questions. Well, if I see this change in biomarker, how much change in, in clinical outcome do I expect? If I have this new drug compared to standard of care in a head-to-head -head trial in the exact same population, the exact same baseline, background medication and all of that, how would that fare? You can do those indirect comparisons with, with, with the sort of a network analysis. That's what is called a mobile based meta analysis. We've been doing this for a long time and we had about 45 of those databases for us to then go in and do the same thing for COVID, starting with the repurposed drugs, starting initially with, with uh, hydroxychloroquine back in the day when, when the, the initial questions were around that. Um, we actually did some other modeling as well on physiologically based PK modeling where we very quickly indicated yeah it's not going to get into the cell at a level that's going to be sufficient with the ic50 that was in the midst of the whole political discussion it was quite a bit of fun to sort of be the scientist in the room on that one um these we're, we're going to build out this database further now to the uh, the combination therapies of re, uh, repurposed drugs i think that's one of those questions that we have as well you know take hiv it took us 20 years to figure out what the optimal combination is surely we're not going to take 20 years to now figure out how to combine these repurposed drugs into a new therapy that can be done a lot, lot faster. And then running trials that are much more adaptive and, and uh, combinatorial in, in their nature, feeding into the, the models that we have to then get the right answers. And of course, we'll, we'll, we started on the vaccine information as well, but that's limited. But by the time the phase three data comes out, we'll start feeding more and more of that in there. And then we can start answering those questions, which are going to be helpful, I think, for healthcare providers, for governments that need to make these large investments on, on rolling out what is the, the right vaccine. Um, another uh, application of this is, is what we call quantitative systems pharmacology. This is very different. So you're not looking at clinical existing data that we model and then fit, fit models to. Here we're actually building very large mathematical descriptions of disease, of what we know about the biology and how that interacts. So think about all those cascading pathways of certain markers in the body, how that translates to, to effects. Um, and we originally, um, over the last couple of years, were building a model that could predict immunogenetic response to monoclonal antibodies. So if you develop a monoclonal antibody, sometimes you get these unwanted immunogenetic responses. And based on the allergenic representation of, of, of a monoclonal antibody, we could predict what the level of immunogenic uh, response would be. And again, that's unwanted. So uh, Pete van der Graaf, our, our, our sort of key opinion leader in this field, that's sort of a brainwave thinking, well, that's unwanted. But with vaccines, we ha have a wanted immunogenic response and the same uh, representation of triggering that immune system and understanding that cascade is something that we can describe which is making sure that we on the front end side to describe that that uh, representation that elicits the response and then how the response cascades down is something that we can then use and then we can start asking ourselves those questions so do you need something different than elderly um, 
if we look at young and elderly, we, we create these virtual patients. And, and so you take into account the genetics, background medication, comorbidity, but, uh, but mostly in this case, it's the, uh, the aging of the immune system, the slowness of the immune system. You can train a model on all sorts of data. It doesn't have to be from this vaccine specifically. You can do that basically on, on the known biology. Um, and so prior to having any client paying for this, we started creating these models ourselves, which typically as a service organization, consulting organization, you always want a paying client, but in situations like this, you invest a little bit. And, and so it allowed us to, to figure out what level of effectiveness we could predict from the model. And again, behind this is hundreds of differential equations in the computer uh, to then say, well, what do you need in, in an elderly person to then translate that to what dose level or how frequent do you need to dose? How quickly does this wane off again? And, and all those discussions around now about initial response, the B cells, and the, the longer response, the memory response through the T cells. Expounding that knowledge as it emerges, you build it into the model. Um, and that allows us to do this. And since we've actually now uh, started projects on this with uh, large vaccine uh, research companies uh, in, in the world, uh, not only with to share which one, but uh, it is it is one of those kind of compounds in phase three now, and uh, I think it is going to be very helpful asking us uh, asking those additional questions. So at the end of the day, um, what we always say with, with these vaccines, uh, we have to get these things faster to the patients, and um, but we, they need to be safe. Of course, they're going to be safe, and that's why we study them in thirty to sixty thousand patients, and and no argument on that. But I think with that focus on safety we don't always think about the efficacy. And the first generation may come in with efficacy that's going to be you know, 50, 60% of protection. That may be just about good enough, 70% would be better. And then it's the question, how many people actually will accept taking the, the vaccine to get the herd immunity? A vaccine does not protect you, it protects the population that then protects you. It's the herd immunity that matters at the end of the day. And, and I think, that's really where we're trying to put a lot of focus. So getting it right, get, get the dose right the first time around um, is, is, is all the key, uh, is, is the key here. I think when it comes down to, again, the step back into the commercialization of this and running a healthy business, uh, we've seen some slowdown initially in, in the non-COVID areas because the industry was slowing down. We jumped in and we sort of supplemented that with COVID work because we could. and and very quickly, the rest of the industry, the rest of the things sort of started coming back up online as well. Um, we've actually seen growth over this period. Now, um, as a scientist gone commercial, it always has this double feeling. It actually feels really good that we can contribute here, that we can actually provide these sorts of new approaches in this field. Um, so I think, yeah, very exciting times and um, more than happy to answer any questions. I guess we'll go into the panel discussion. We'll have a few more topics around the commercialization itself. All right, Thomas, thank you very much. Any questions? Can you model with the various vaccines what happens if you give them to someone who has been asymptomatically already infected? So they have memory B cells, they have memory T cells. And I mean, I know from the Q fever fields that people that are vaccinated that have had the infection get really bad side effects. And I can't find in the various clinical trials whether they're actively looking at that group. Whereas, I mean, in the Netherlands, we will have tons of healthcare workers that have been infected, just don't know it. Uh, and then we're going to vaccinate those first. I really would love to hear what you said. Yeah. And if you can model that, I think it's something you can model. Yeah, well, I think, and, and, and the answer is uh, yes, in principle. Um, and so with any of these models, whenever there is a new sort of insight into the biology, if we think that's how it works, can we train the model? Do we know what are the differences exactly? Are there some preclinical experiments that can help us inform on those differences? Can we measure something to inform and train the model on that? Then you can start simulating it out. And where there is uncertainty, where you don't know, you do sensitivity checks. So what if that difference is only X? What if that difference is larger? What does that actually mean? Do you then need to pick a different dose? Do you need to do something different? And then bringing that back to those drug development questions all the time, that's the critical point. There's quite a bit of these nuances 
that actually don't matter <laughs> uh, when it comes down to treatment <laughs> paradigms and, and, and things like that. But I do think, you know, this is exactly where we can help with models. It's not that model, we, we, don't, we don't make up data. We don't make up new things. It's a mathematical description, which are, are typically very complex nonlinear processes. And that's what you all add up uh, in a model and then simulate it out. So I do, I do think those areas exactly, um, it's, it's the moment there's T cell activation on how are they going to respond differently. And, and also things like time course are very relevant. Stimulating an immune system while there's already a risk of our, uh, an overshoot, uh, which actually makes people really sick and go into, uh, into the ICU. That's the last thing you want. And so the timing perspective, we see this in combination therapies as well. Mm -hmm. The timing is so critical. Initially, you want to inhibit uh, viremia. Later on, you want to inhibit uh, the immune system. You don't want to spot that around. And so the timing of that in, in combination therapy is, again, something you simulate, feeding it in from, from trials coming in. All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry we don't have time to go. One other question, but I'm sure you're going to find each other later. So let's go on to the third presentation. Christian von Messer can ask you. Mike. Hi everyone, everyone online. Um, let me see how do I get to the next slide. This one. I'm going to talk about um, how my company, HM Medical, how we conquered COVID-19 as a company, as a business, actually. Um, this one. Uh, first introduction of myself, um, Christopher Munster. I have studied biochemistry here in AME, and in 2000 I started a company in AME called EMCM, quite small company. Worked there until 2009, uh, eventually was part of the management uh, team, and uh, the company was grown from about 15 people to 200. Uh, we had an international organization at that time. 2010, I uh, founded Rambai Consultancy, located here at the Novotec campus. And in 2014, um, I founded HCM Medical, uh, a co-founder. And I did it together with Henriette Falster. At that time, she was director of EMCM. So we uh, we met again at your lunch. We said, okay, maybe this is time to start a new company because the other company, they stopped doing some business, especially uh, starting new uh, innovations. So what did we do? We, we uh, wrote investment plans. It was the year 2015, so we needed money. We needed to invest in clean rooms. We needed to invest in equipment, um, getting licenses in. With my background as a consultant in, in ISO certifications and GMP, luckily we didn't have to hire someone for that. Um, so in 2016, we, we spent all the money. We built clean rooms. We um, uh, some freeze dryers installed, supercritical CO2 extractors, and other equipment that we need to have to, to actually uh, make the products. 2017, we were able to get our ISO 3485 certification, and we are accredited by the Dutch Health Organization to work on human tissues. So we have a, a tissue assembly license. Um, these are two different product categories. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, Later, we chose for the BSI because at that time there was a really uh, notable which which had a high standard. Um, at the current time, it's quite difficult to get a notable mm -hmm. body uh, to work with you as a company. So, in 2018, we had first regular manufacturing started, and in 2020, uh, we had COVID. Not as a person, but of course, as a situation. So, what do we do at uh, HM? We, um, Especially, we, we work with tissues. We make uh, medical implants made out of biomaterials, human as well as animal. If it is a human material that we make into a medical implant, uh, it falls under the tissue directive. So you don't need to have an ISO certification for that. But therefore, we have a tissue uh, license. And if it is animal material, um, like like uh, porcine pericardia or trachea or aortas, then it will become a medical device, and you have to have the ISO certification for that. Um, with our processes, we, we do uh, process tissue, we extract cells, extract DNA, extract viruses, and we purify the, the products. Um, also, what we can do, we can impregnate with antibiotics, for instance. 
And um, we are working now on getting uh, our CO2 process approved uh, as sterilization methods, because a lot of medical devices, which contain biologicals or biomaterials, they um, will not be uh, very effective if you sterilize them with, with gamma or with ETO or with, with moist heat. And so the CO2 process is a very yeah, mild process, actually. Uh, the process is, is working on ways that CO2 brings you, uh, you bring CO2 in supercritical phase. There you have the property of gas and a liquid, so you can penetrate very deep into the, uh, into the pores and you can wash out everything that is the, the property of the liquid. Um, the market that we're in uh, is mainly orthopedic and dental. Uh, cardiovascular, we are working with a lot of universities and organizations to develop uh, trachea. We already have uh, proven that we can fully decellarize trachea and aortas and other um, materials as well. And we're doing now recellularization studies to see how fast can we let cells grow into these uh, materials again. Um, cosmetic and urology. The orthopedics, the bone, uh, is already product that's in the market being used in patients, as well as for dental applications, uh, as orthopedic applications. And for dental, we also have membranes, which we make out of porcine pericards. So these are already uh, used. So when you start a company, you think about, I have to set a budget, for at least for the next years, but also for the, for the coming uh, year. So you see, we started 2015. In 2015, we, we got some money in. Then 2016, 17, 18, 19, we, we saw that we had a quite a stable grow. And our budget for 2020 was this. So almost double of 2019, which is, of course, very good because then we are finally going to earn some money because the black line is our break even. Um, this sheet I want to show you because this is uh, also something that's important for our business. We are in orthopedic market, we are in the dental market. At least those are our biggest markets at the moment. Um, that was also our difficulty because what happened? Uh, all operating theaters, they closed. No normal surgery was being performed. No knee replacement, no hip replacement was performed. So no orthopedic surgeons. All the, uh, the dentists, they, they closed their uh, they say they're, they're treatments, they didn't do anything. And we have clients in Spain, in Barcelona, we have clients in the UK. They have been, for instance, in Barcelona, uh, our client, he had to stay in house for three months. But we're only allowed to go out for one hour walk because he had some children. Um, that's not good for the business. So we had 80% loss of turnover during the first period. Uh, that's, of course, terrible. Uh, it scares the hell out of you. So we were thinking, do we have an economic crisis or what do we have to do with it? So this is what we figure, our budget for the first quarter and the, the, the second, third, fourth. You see that the second quarter, we had a really, uh, let's say, not, not a very good, good turnover, not what we had budgeted because of this uh, loss of turnover. So what did we do? We sat together and we defined a Corona budget. So what will uh, what do we have to do with the current situation and how can we uh, handle it? Uh, what we did, we discussed prepayments with clients. The clients who said, uh, I cannot get your problem now because I cannot do any surgery with it. We have asked them, okay, but can we uh, discuss something that every month we get a payment in and at the time that you are able to do your surgery again, you can get your products and we are, uh, say the prepayments are covered. Uh, we have applied for an MIT. We speeded it up because that was money that we could get in. Um, we didn't pay any management fees to ourselves. And on the other hand, we had a, an OA arrangement to be able to pay our uh, employees because that was uh, very important. We stopped redemptions from the bank and we postponed uh, tax payments. So it was a kind of survival mode that we were in. The first initiatives that were raised in, in, in the Netherlands was what we did, we communicated our availability of clean rooms, laboratories and services. We did it through the RIVM, OSNL, the Landlijk Consortium Hulp Middle, Economic Board, website, Cadence. It was an initiative, a viral alert that we joined. We showed that we could clean facial masks for reuse, so we made them sterile again, and zero response. So that was uh, our, uh, that is our experience. 
for these initiatives. So we work from our own initiatives, use our own uh, network and our own strengths. We have started purification of collagen from food grade to medical grade. There's a lot of collagen that you can eat or you can have in these shakes, etc. cetera. Um, and two multinationals, they want to, um, let's say, they, they want to, to give a high quality to this collagen and, and because it's worth much more if it's, of course, a medical product. So we have started collaboration with two multinationals in the food industry for that. Um, and also what we did, what came out of it is that uh, we have collagen product development for veterinary applications, not only human, but also veterinary. Um, we have more intense collaboration with universities. We work a lot with universities, a lot with students. We have them in-house every uh, year. Um, and this resulted in uh, requests to manufacture clinical batches. Um, we started two with the uh, Technical University of Eindhoven and one of the University of Ghent in Belgium. Um, um, one very local initiative is a cooperation with, with Avivia. Um, we have, uh, of course, our ISO 3485. We have dish assessment, we have a quality system which is fully compliant with GMP. But we never got a question to make a medicine, medicinal products. We have a lot of experience with making uh, medicines, also with investigation medicinal products. But as a contract manufacturer, if you don't get a question for it, you will not invest in it. We sat together with Avivia, and um, Avivia is, is uh, developed a COVID-19 um, medicine, and we are going to manufacture it. Uh, it's called an investigation medicine product. Um, the GMP, if you want to have GMP in house, you have to go to Pharmatech and the Dutch Health Spectrum IGA. And they are at the moment very, uh, they're booked, they, they, they don't have time for anything. Uh, so luckily, um, we knew the inspector who was in the CC, one of the mails that I received. So we called him and said, please, can you come over quite quickly? And we arranged it that it would be in within one month, which is, of course, very exceptional. So build on your own strength. And, and innovate where you can innovate yourself. It's actually the lesson that we learned from it. And what you saw is that in the third quarter, the business started coming back again. What Phoenix uh, were, were, were in business, the, the dentists were in business. So, combination with the new business that we started up, we actually had a high turnover and we budgeted for that month. And of course, that's not surprising me, but I think it's a good, a good result, what we did. What you see here is 2020. The dark green line is uh, our turnover, which uh, has happened already. The light green is what we have not only budgeted, but what we have uh, also uh, in orders and in contracts. And the, the orange part is what we are, are maybe going to be missing um, from the original budget. So actually, we are above this break even line, which is uh, a very good success. And we have uh, some new opportunities coming up. Um, as I mentioned before, our process, we can inactivate viruses because if you have animal material, you have to have a uh, virus activation step involved. Um, human tissue are still being used uh, in, in, in the uh, operating theaters as fresh. That means if someone gets a new femoral or he breaks his hip and uh, the, 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 the gets a new uh, implant, um, they still use fresh bone from another patient, which has been frozen for six months, has been tested on five different viruses, but we don't know what other viruses are in there. So uh, our belief, actually, I think, is that these tissues cannot be implanted anymore because they, they can have a lot of other viruses which we do not know. So we want to apply our process on these tissues. And we want to execute a, a virus activation study on COVID to demonstrate that also this typical virus we can inactivate. So actually the conclusion that we, we made of spirit is that HM Medical, we, we are a contract manufacturer, so we, we are um, used to deal with all different kinds of requests. Um, so that is our strength. And you always have to work from your own strength. Don't wait until someone else starts something and try to jump on the train, but make sure that you are in the train and you're actually the, uh, what's the machinist, the, the, the driver of the train who is in front. And respond and act immediately. And what's also very important is this is a team effort. So well, I think you can give a thumbs up to the 
team of HCM Medical. Uh, we did it all together. And actually, um, one vision uh, FP started uh, three weeks ago, and next week we'll have two other people in. So we are not only growing financially, but we are also growing as, uh, as a company. And these people, we, it was quite difficult to find. We used AMT React, it's an organization here uh, nearby. They were able to find, uh, I think, about eight people who are uh, could, work, could work in clean rooms, and we selected uh, from these people. Good, good. Uh, so actually, we we have uh, come with COVID. I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice combination of uh, of business and uh, new innovations. Thank you very much for that. Are there any questions? Well, then, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, thank it's you. fall break, I think, isn't it? It's fall break. Are we alive? Yeah, thank you, Al. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Round the uh, little little change in the program. We're going to do three presentations, and then a small break, and then a panel discussion. So step two presentations, and then a break. So, I'd like to give the floor to Nick Olderberg. Olderberg. Yes, thank you. Sure. Sure. 
Okay. Well, uh, hello uh, to all the people at home. <laughs> and uh, thank you for inviting us uh, to uh, give the opportunity to tell a little bit about uh, our story, uh, how we uh, conquered uh, COVID. Uh, I'm Nienke Oldenburg and uh, responsible for the marketing communication uh, within uh, in process MSP. Well, I'll tell uh, briefly something about uh, our company, what we do and what we plan to do beginning this year uh, and uh, how we came to a standstill. Um, but there was a light at the end of the tunnel and we speed it up again and what did we learn from that? Um, well, in process MSP uh, was founded in uh, 2014 by uh, three uh, ex-employees of uh, Organol, currently uh, MSD, and um, they innovated the uh, nanoparticle sizer, the nanoflow sizer, um, but they are also experts in process analytical technology. And so they have a lot of knowledge uh, in science uh, around processes. We are uh, located at the pivot part, yes. And um, well, the last uh, few years we uh, grew from three to ten people uh, in our organization. Um, well, the nanoflow sizer was um, launched last year, so a few instruments were sold last year. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what this instrument does. Um, it um, does particle size analysis, but currently uh, in processes, um, in lots of uh, um, manufacturing sites, um, people have to take samples during their process, uh, which interferes with the process or it interrupts. And they even have to dilute uh, these samples to be able to measure anything. Um, but what we uh, decided to, you know, our innovation, yes, um, we uh, with our nylon fly sizer can um, discard this step and um, we are able to measure nanoparticles in line. That means that while your process is running, uh, we can measure nanoparticles and we uh, do the particle size analysis and characterization. And a lot of companies these days are um, uh, synthesizing nanoparticles in lots of uh, various um, fields, and all of them want to know what is the size of our nanoparticle. So it is really very important to be able to measure this. And uh, the Nanoflow Sizer is the only instrument uh, doing this at the moment worldwide in line. So uh, some extra few features of this instrument uh, are, um, well, you get real-time feedback uh, during your process while you're measuring. Um, so you don't need to um, interrupt or um, interfere in the process, which is really nice. And uh, you get a result every 10 seconds. So it's really fast measurement and you can measure as long as you like. Uh, typical samples are um, liposomes, vaccines, um, emulsions, polymers, um, iron particles. As long as they are nanoparticles in the nanometer scale, uh, we can measure this with our instrument. So we have a, a big market like uh, the pharmaceutical market, but also the um, ink market, uh, chemistry, polymers, uh, cosmetics, food. Um, everywhere where there are nanoparticles. Um, well, this is giving you uh, just uh, an indication of uh, how the setup is in the lab. Um, well, we have an instrument already in an R&D uh, setting. Um, so it's, it's used in an R&D lab, uh, but you can also use it in the uh, development uh, setup. And even in manufacturing, when you have uh, larger scales, uh, it's uh, very convenient to uh, implement the nanoflow sizer. And online, uh, real time, you can measure particles. Uh, it will show you on the screen of the instrument that um, the size is growing or decreasing or whatever. So, um, 
beginning this year, we were in a quite a turbulent phase because uh, our company was growing fast and uh, we were just uh, starting to commercialize our instrument. And uh, well, this is maybe a familiar picture for you, uh, the typical sales funnel. Um, but our uh, attention was really on the, the upper part. Uh, you know, you have to create awareness in the field because uh, we are uh, well, not a very big uh, corporate company and uh, a, a very new innovative technology. Um, so we mainly focused on the first part um, and that mean, meant that we were going to trade shows, conferences, we organized demonstration events and even uh, some customer projects were already going on and um, our main market is in the US. So Boston area, there is, you know, most of our uh, pharma market at the moment. So there was uh, a lot of traveling, traveling planned uh, beginning this year. Well, then, of course, the corona kicked in and everything came to a standstill. We couldn't travel, we couldn't uh, organize our demo events, we couldn't go to conferences, uh, which was for us uh, uh, sort of a, well, set back uh, and um, well, breathe uh, three times uh, because what we were planning to do also in uh, customer projects, and you can see it here, uh, this is our normal approach when we um, start some projects or we have an interest uh, out of the field. Uh, we start with screening, um, you know, these processes for each customer is very specific so we have to uh, do some research on their application um, we do a feasibility study in our lab um, and then see if everything works um, and then the next step is implementation at the customer site and that means that we travel there we do uh, install the instrument we do some testing uh, we have a look at their process uh, at all the different um uh, details in their process because every every process is different and they have their own challenges and then uh, we uh, hope to end up with a purchase where we also have to install again and travel to the customer and well again our customers are mainly in the us well no go because uh, we couldn't travel anymore so we had to um, sit back and uh, think and uh, be creative and uh, well, breathe a few, few times and think, okay, what can we do? And um, uh, what is still possible in, the, in this uh, phase of our company? So first we uh, started to organize some webinars. Well, a lot of uh, companies did that. <laughs> um, but also we were thinking about, um, you know, is it possible to do things remotely without traveling? And um, well, this installation we have to do for our instrument is, uh, is quite a challenge. And of course, uh, uh, we are always the experts. The experts are in the house and uh, no one else can install this instrument. Our baby, you know, this goes wrong that for sure. But okay, well, we couldn't travel, so we, uh, we had to think about uh, alternatives. And uh, because we just were starting up some nice collaboration in, um, in the US uh, with a, um, uh, a lab in, uh, of the University of Connecticut, we thought, well, let's do a tryout there and see if we can make this work, you know, uh, remotely install our machine and uh, see if things uh, will go all right. Uh, and it was a low impact location, uh, you know, not too much risk of uh, failing uh, in front of some others. Uh, so we decided to, um, to create some uh, materials for this uh, documentation, manuals, videos, connections, etc. Uh, but we didn't uh, come to this tryout at all because um, some big top three pharmaceutical company name starts with a P and the rest is uh, uh, Pfizer. <laughs> they rang us and said, you know, we are interested in your nanoflow sizer. We are currently uh, developing uh, uh, the vaccine for COVID and um, 
uh, we want to uh, test this in our lab in the US and uh, preferably within three weeks. And then we thought, okay, <laughs> we weren't really ready for this, but um, well, of course you don't say uh, you don't say no. Um, so yeah, we uh, say, okay, we can manage, but we really have to uh, speed up things. So we made a sort of an IKEA uh, toolbox um, with pictures. You can see on the left side uh, how uh, all the uh, parts are, uh, uh, you know, organized, and we uh, made instructions. And um, well, on the right side you just see the instrument, but this is not in the process yet. But still, this is already a bit of a challenge uh, to let the customer do this uh, themselves. Uh, of course, that's what we thought, that was our mindset, you know, we have to do that, we have to look at their setting, and uh, anyway, we uh, we uh, changed our mindset about that and said, okay, well, uh, we all give the instruction, and um, they um, did it at their place with an online connection uh, with us, a video and uh, a software connection, and um, the biggest challenge, which is uh, tricky, is this. They have to set up everything in their process. In their process, we did not much know much about their process, of course, and it's all very secret. Um, but, um, well, we tried to manage and uh, to also add to that, that, you know, there are quite some parameters which are making uh, each process a bit of a challenge to um, measure with our nanoflow sizer. Um, we really would like to customize this uh, uh, for each process and it's not really a plug and play instrument. But what, for instance, all these aspects are really important to know, you know, temperature, viscosity, um, particle size, you know, we have to measure between uh, a certain size and all the other stuff are also important to know. So we discussed these aspects and uh, made sure that we uh, try to configure our instrument in the right way. And then we went through uh, all these steps in a very, very high pace. And there was a lot of commitment on our side with the whole team and also on the customer side, there was a lot of commitment. They uh, talked about aggressive timelines they had to speed up really fast to develop their vaccine. And so what we did, we did some uh, test trials. We, uh, we installed the instrument at the uh, location of uh, this big pharma company in the US. And uh, well, results, uh, the first test results were really promising. So that was a, a first start of some relief. And then, um, you know, some more uh, results in line with uh, inflow measurements were also giving good results. So what happened, this company decided we buy two instruments instead of one, or sort of, you know, only thinking about one, but they wanted two instruments and, oh yes, um, within six weeks, up and running, which again for us was quite challenging. Uh, anyway, we, um, um, we had to find out if we could get all the uh, parts of the instrument because we are also dependent on some external suppliers. We uh, collected everything really uh, fast, um, assembled two instruments in our lab and tested them, organized all the shipment uh, customs, which is, can also be uh, quite some hassle, and um, the paperwork for uh, quotes and orders, etc. We did some shortcuts there to speed things up a bit more. And, um, well, to give you an idea, uh, we were used to a time schedule of uh, six to 12 months for a normal situation before COVID, first contact to installation because we, we travel to the customer and uh, set up things locally, inspect all the details around their process and uh, configure everything. But now in this situation, we um, did an installation within three months. And there was one instrument in the EU installed and one in the US installed in these three months. So the outcome there for us was um, really nice. Uh, we were really 
happy with, um, you know, that we could, we found out that we could do this whole process, which we didn't know before, but we did it three to four times faster than before. So, and also because we now uh, had more confidence in a, uh, we, we gained more confidence in our instrument because the customer themselves uh, have in, installed the whole, uh, the whole uh, application. Um, well, that uh, was for us also a, an eye opener really. Um, and on the other hand, we were really happy to contribute also to, uh, you know, the urgency and the timelines of this uh, vaccine development. And, and we are also, uh, well, a little bit proud that we can uh, contribute to uh, a more uh, production efficiency because uh, there is no other instrument in the world which can measure in a real time these uh, nanoparticle uh, uh, characterization. So it's really an improvement for these kind of processes. And of course, uh, lessons learned are, you know, how fast this can go. We never knew before. And, uh, you know, if things are going fast, then you also save money, of course. Um, so this was really uh, something nice for uh, a nice eye opener for us. Uh, well, we also learned uh, some, some negative things uh, during the COVID uh, period because uh, we, uh, well, we had to cancel all these uh, conferences and demonstration events which was a pity, uh, they're still in the fridge, uh, as I can say, and uh, well, th that we cannot have any direct contact with these uh, prospects or potential customers is also a pity, because uh, we would like to uh, go over and uh, discuss uh, things. Um, and we also uh, are a bit worried about budgets of our uh, potential customers, of course, because uh, budgets were withdrawn and uh, I think they still are. So it will be uh, probably also difficult in 2021. But again, the good, uh, the good things are that without these uh, COVID restrictions, uh, we wouldn't have, uh, we would never have optimized our workflow so significantly. Uh, we never have thought about this and um, well, this is really a major improvement for us and also for our future uh, projects because uh, we can now continue of continue with this way of working you know doing things remotely we know that it works and uh, it saves us a lot of money and this uh, uh, and next to that it's a very sustainable solution as well so that for us was really a uh, really a, a good part but still, you know, uh, creating awareness uh, in our field, in the world, about our technology is a, a challenge, a big challenge. So uh, I would like to end the presentation uh, by asking maybe some other companies who deal with the same uh, limitations. Uh, have, have they got other suggestions? Can we discuss, you know, how they uh, attack uh, this uh, limitation um, to, um, well, to create more awareness in the field. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nuki. Um, questions? Panel, what over I... oh. Yeah, I, well, maybe we can, um, we can uh, uh, discuss it in the panel. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Okay. Start with that one. Okay, thank you very much. Shall we go to the next presentation? Ben, so we go to the viruses. Where were the viruses? All right, thanks for the uh, invite. Um, so we work on antivirals and to come back to your last question. If you work on antivirals to create awareness, a pandemic will help. <laughs> um, but that's not what we aimed for. We, um, we are a company, startup company, um, working on antivirals against dengue and Zika and the family of flaviviruses. 
And we would have normally reached our proof of concept, that means uh, efficacy in animal models by Q2 of this year. Um, so we're all lined up for that. We were making good progress. And well, you said it as your first presentation I saw, sorry, pretty else. Um, then COVID happened and we were also struck by that uh, because all the labs that were running our assays, these are free uh, licenses you need for that uh, to work with these uh, pathogenic uh, viruses um, are all not closed, but they're all working only on COVID. So our program was just kicked out with a, a visa free facility that we worked with, and uh, we had to look for another one, um, which we did by the end, but it took us uh, almost half a year. So we are now looking at to reach the proof concept on the dengue work uh, by the end of this year. Um, so that's the main setback for us. We are set we are a startup, we are running out of funding. Uh, luckily, this uh, COL instrument came to uh, existence. And although it's, it's, it's very limited to what we can uh, put in, because afterwards we had to move to another country for the visa free work that's more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So the COL doesn't cover for what we lost, not in time, and certainly not in the efforts that we have to put in. Um, so that, that's the, the setbacks, etc. Um, then, of course, because we are working on, on antivirals, fearless ramos, that also creates a, a possibility because we work by a mechanism of um, protease inhibition. And uh, protease inhibition is actually a well, um, well accepted concept in, in antivirals. So for HIV and for hepatitis C, there are protease inhibitors as, that work as, as blockbusters and really help to um, decrease the impact of such chronic diseases. For dengue, there's also a protease that you can target. It's, it's, it, it's a challenging one, it's more challenging than HIV or the hep C, for example, but we found good compounds. Um, what we then saw that also in this COVID work, I think I'm going different than my slides will uh, go, I think I'll just tell the story as I uh, experienced it and keep the slides as a backup. Um, so we, we thought that maybe there are some things that we can do because we have a library of compounds that work as protein. So let's just see and if we can test it. That is, of course, out of the scope of your current funding program. So you would then have to convince your shareholders, your stakeholders, which is not easy because you then do not reach your milestones. Um, so what we did is uh, approach several Dutch funding bodies and also actually we went broader uh, talking to venture capital which we were discussing anyway for our next investment series what what do you think so we uh, so we can we do something together there but, um, well there's a risk for for venture capital of course to dig into uh, something like covid because you may develop something now but who knows when the next pandemic is going to occur. We know there will be a next pandemic, maybe not by, by COVID or SARS-CoV-2, but there will be a SARS-CoV-3, I'm pretty sure about that, within the next five to 10 years. So you can start all over if you want with vaccine development. And we know that the protease is conserved. That is, we know that for the, for the Flavia viruses, and then it's Zika, West Nile. Um, so you can use a, a, an antiviral to combat not only dengue and Dengue alone, but also for Zika and the others. And the same holds for the for the Corona family. The, the protease, there's actually two in, involved there. The protease is is uh, very heavily conserved in terms of um, peptide sequence, but also in terms of free dimensional structure. So if you make something against one of them, it's very likely that you will also make something against SARS-CoV-3 or MERS-2 or whatever. It's coming up. Um, so we thought that that is maybe not only risk but also opportunity. But so um, we, we dig further and also talked to um, funding bodies. And at the end, at, at one point, we were discussing with Health Holland, and they were setting up an emergency um, um, program to do again do something against COVID. So um, what we did was talk to them and, and state messages like we have on this slide. And we have uh, not only this outbreak, we probably have future outbreaks as well of Corona. 
And uh, we believe that we can make something that will also prevent the next one from happening. Or, well, not prevent the next one from happening, but at least being able to manage an outbreak. Right? So have an outbreak management tool or OMT. Um, so what we set out then was to uh, well, first show these kinds of numbers and show that it's not only uh, Corona, Corona and Flavi farms with influenza and uh, we work with our host house, he can dig up uh, from his sleeve uh, a dozen or so viruses that, po that pose um, a pandemic threat. So we um, then set out to work with some part partners and so we chose to work with, with the top virologists in the Netherlands and with parties that we already have good connection with. So we are, we are spin out, uh, if you wish, from the Radboud University, the, the chemistry department. And of course, then we have built um, expertise on, on building and designing protease inhibitors with them. So we asked them, of course, to be part of that. Also with uh, Leiden University Medical Center, we contacted and um, Utrecht University. And here from the building with uh, Hans Batteo from Avivia. Um, he he was sitting on several compounds that could be used for the purpose, and many of them are also targeted proteins. Um, so we proposed this to Health Holland, and uh, after some discussion, we uh, we came to a setup that should work like this. So in, in principle, if you have this setup, you are a mini pharmaceutical or a virtual pharmaceutical company, so you can develop something from lead discovery or hit and the lead optimization, etc all the way to something that you can um, consider as a preclinical or clinical candidate and even go further in formulation and so you have something ready that can go into um, a, a clinical phase one trial. And if you have that, that means that you're ready when the next outbreak comes. Then you can use your uh, that to, to, to prove your proof of concept. Um, so that's the idea. Uh, that's also what we proposed to Health Holland, but there were many private parties involved there. And then you can into some interesting aspects that are called um, state study, state aid. And uh, well, apparently that's very important if you work on antivirals. But um, so there's a little bit of frustration here, maybe. Um, if you're KLM, you get three billion. Um, anyways, we got this one million to uh, to move further and um, build this uh, consortium called uh, Pound Coronet and well, the partners I just mentioned. Um, and we, um, well, initially we aimed to get 10 million or so to really get fast to our preclinical candidate or clinical candidate even if we could move to a phase one study and you can move fast in, in, in a pandemic like this. The patients are everywhere and uh, so it's, it's very easy to set this up. Also, you can then even combine phase one, phase two things. We know that also from the work that we do on dengue and the potential that we got in, uh, in Brazil, for example, to, to, to uh, perform studies like that. Um, so well, we thank, of course, Health Holland for, for funding us and uh, we sent out to test our compounds. Um, Initial results are indeed looking looking pretty okay. Um, and I think this part that I stayed here, I'll prepare for next wave and or other things I already mentioned. Um, but I think that's what we should move to as, um, as, as a country, as a world even, because uh, it is pretty sure that a next um, outbreak, maybe not Corona, but other viruses. We know, for example, now that in um, in Spain, there's a, there's a West Nile virus outbreak. In Germany, Leipzig, there's a West Nile virus outbreak. Um, last week, um, a Dutch bird was infected with the West Nile virus. So it's, this is a zoonotic um, disease. So it can then move find the mosquito to the humans. And also the first Dutch uh, woman who was conducting uh, dengue fever from, uh, from France was just mentioned on the news last week. So this is, um, it doesn't stop with this uh, coronavirus, there's, there's plenty of more and well, we're actually working on this for some time and we hope to be able to, to move further on. Um, 
and well, I, th this is my I, I, I boxed this last statement. This is more my personal personal view than maybe a necessary protein view. But uh, I believe that an extended version of this on Coronet um, setup will give you the preparedness as I sketched in the previous slide. And then you're ready, uh, but you need the proper financing for that. And of course, there is a risk for venture capital parties uh, in this. Um, but maybe then, it, uh, if that's, that's a real risk, which I actually also, also can, can um, in, in describe, um, this should come then from public money. So this maybe this Groei Fund is something that uh, should be considered to put money into this. In addition, I believe that um, if I see what's happening now, I think it's very brilliant that, that all these companies work on vaccines and getting the vaccines ready. Um, but it's, it's like um, uh, going into a casino and you put everything in red, yeah? and red being the vaccine. There's so much money going on there, and I think that, that money needs to be there also to get the vaccine ready in, in, in this short time. But there are several risks involved in, in vaccine development. And you don't know whether the vaccine works as well as it does. Well, you have now 10 or more candidates that are promising, so one of them will work, probably. But we also know for Corona that um, um, people can get um, ill not once but twice or three times and for for this corona it has been shown a few times but also from uh, an Amsterdam group they uh, they point into this direction so we do not know how well the vaccine is and uh, in terms of another vaccine trial we know that um, uh, Sanofi Pasteur it's in our own field for dengue um, has tried to put up a vaccine against dengue and uh, they went to um, conclude a a clinical phase three trial, so they went to market, and at the end they had to uh, take it off the market due to uh, safety issues that were known that could occur with uh, with Um So this, I think, it's always a big gamble to um, to move on, on one thing on. Now, um, just some some preliminary results. How much time do I have? Two minutes. All right, I'll wait. Um, so we, we, we do biochemical protease inhibition and well our early candidate, which we suspected early in March that would work, and we tested that against Camusat because it hits the same target, and we see that in terms of potency we have a compound that's 100 times better. And now in uh, maybe the um, um, Health Holland project, we have seen that several other compounds also work better in terms of cellular potency than Remdesivir. And Remdesivir, we, we know this is a uh, compound by Gilead that has been repurposed from uh, Ebola towards um, um, uh, COVID. Um, so we know that our compounds are twice better. Of course, they were further advanced, so they could move faster. And I'm happy that they did because that gives some relief. Um, but also we would like to move these compounds further because they are in principle good clinical candidates. But the Health Holland Consortium does not give us the opportunity to go into animal models. It's a lead finding. Yeah. Yeah, you get stuck on these, uh, well, to me, stupid things. Um, so we, we are looking for additional funding for this. So if you have some few hundred thousand in your pockets and are willing to risk it on COVID, we're happy to talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> But that's the uh, well, that's current status. And of course, we, we have done one run of testing. We want to test much more. Um, but it also means that we have been able to, in, in half year time, we have to show that the compounds are not only working on dengue, but they actually are, are very potent hits against uh, other diseases, in this case, corona. And we have not tested other things, but we know that other proteases are involved also in other diseases. So we have a good um, 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 technology based to work on all kinds of diseases, which we would like to explore. I think that's it within the two minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Quite a lot of work getting uh, different people and companies together. Any questions? If not, so we go to the Last but not least, so we talked about uh, innate in immunology, we talked about vaccines, we talked about medicine, and now I think we're going to go to uh, testing and antibodies. 
Ayagat, to you the floor. Let's see if this works. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I always, uh, that's been a time that I had to give talks so often that at some point I said, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and uh, when I drove up here, I realized I haven't been here for years because there were all sorts of new buildings, different routes. So my apologies, but I'll uh, better my life uh, at some point. Uh, everybody, uh, probably not at home, but at work somewhere uh, also, uh, Good to uh, that you're uh, you're actually listening. Um, let me see. So um, Anja Gerritsen, I'm uh, the CEO of Nathos Laboratories, uh, a small lab in Oss at the Pivot Park, and we actually uh, do all sorts of diagnostics tests in the infectious diseases, uh, and we also have developed. We try to develop them, but that's not always very successful. Uh, and we do some uh, research and we actually have focus on two very, uh, let's say, niche infectious diseases, Q fever, which has been very important in the Netherlands, and uh, Lyme disease. Um, so that's, that's where I come from. I really focus on diagnostics because I think we are really, our slogan is catch it early, make sure that you find the disease early on so you can actually treat early on and don't end up with all these people with uh, issues that will keep them busy for the next 10 or maybe the rest of their lives. And what happened to Q fever, actually I see the same thing happening now for COVID. Uh, people maybe not dying, but actually getting so sick that also young people, that they will probably never recover fully from, from that. Uh, so I want to share with you the Inetos uh, story on SARS-CoV-2. And uh, that actually started before we had the first patient in the Netherlands, because in uh, the middle of February, I was in Herkenbos, that's actually where my mother used to live, and I go there with her every uh, every month, go to concerts, uh, very nice place, uh, nice castle. Uh, but what I didn't know at the time that I was there, and she's 98 old years old, so it's really a risk uh, group, that about 15 kilometers from there, there was a big, the day before there had been a big carnival's party and um, that resulted in a huge outbreak in that area. Uh, of course, the Dutch people are very like, oh, don't panic, don't panic, because we don't have any cases in, in, in Limburg yet. But you have to realize that, uh, so sorry, that this guy who was infected there actually had been in, uh, hotel that was the partner hotel from the one that we were in um, a week earlier. So I really, I, I, I was really, really scared. And then you have to realize as well that in uh, Rumont you have this outlet where like 20,000 people a day come along and they all come from Germany. So I've seen the row. So, so it's like, it's impossible that we will not get any cross-border uh, infections. So before that time, I actually was tweeting about Lyme disease and about uh, uh, vaccines and things that were uh, important to me at that point. But right after the 27th, it's like, okay, fortunately in that hotel, nobody got sick. So I'm pretty sure that that was indeed uh, not an issue. But uh, I mean, the sense of urgency that like we have to do something, there's no way that this is going to be contained within Germany and won't cross the border. Was, was really high. And I, I, I think the top one is nice uh, from uh, uh, early March, Organization of Health Study has decided to postpone or to not uh, have that uh, meeting. And I thought that was a really good uh, example of how we should uh, deal with, uh, with a, a, an epidemic like this. Uh, then the next thing that happened, of course, we had the first patient in uh, the Netherlands in Novo Sons. Um, the guy was definitely not the first case in the Netherlands. We had a couple more. I mean, we have no few that actually uh, must have gotten sick before he ever did. But he was fortunate because he actually traveled to Italy, got back sick. But because he was in Italy, he was allowed to be tested for COVID. If you would have had the same symptoms and hadn't been in Italy at that time, uh, you wouldn't get tested. 
Um, so where we, we, we were sort of ending up with our annual lime screening for that season, but we always in spring we do, we run uh, foresters, etc. We, we test them for Lyme disease. Uh, we get all our new clients. Uh, we were doing some really nice CRO projects, also in the Lyme disease area. We had a few Q fever projects, one for Q supports, which is a patient organization, but also one for a World Health Organization. And we have a big vac Q fever vaccine program that is funded by uh, the, the uh, military in the United States. And uh, that's always funny that you get your Q fever money, not from the Dutch government, but from the, uh, from the US. But that was going immediately down green. I mean, everybody has the same issue. Uh, we weren't able, and we were actually simply not able to collect blood, and that's what we need for everything we do. So we couldn't get groups in one room, we couldn't uh, get uh, blood, we actually couldn't even get the health and safety guys uh, weren't willing to talk to us because they had to deal with, uh, with COVID. And then some really unexpected collaborations came along, and that was in the shape of Doreen van Doorn, who is a high school classmate for me, who lives actually in Katshoven, so that's Lone of Sons. She knew the first patient in the Netherlands, and she had two things. They started, a, a, actually, we talked about it a little bit, what, what kind of way should you organize that? She uh, started a foundation, and that's the Stichting Intest. And I mean, she has a huge network, so she knows. I would think she knows everybody in the Netherlands, but whenever we needed something, she had someone to build uh, websites, to do um, uh, logistic stuff. She's a real logistic expert, so she doesn't know anything about diagnostics. But the bit that I couldn't deal with, like, how the hell are we going to do this? She said, eh, piece of cake, I'll deal with that. And she actually did. Uh, we have some other people from our high school class that were actually our first tryout patients that tried to get us into uh, talking to the GGDs. And so we had really had a lot of support. And it was really simple. She said, we should do something. I mean, you've got all this, you've got this lab and you've got all this expertise and it would really be stupid not to do anything. And initially I was really hesitant because I thought, okay, we move into a field that we aren't used to. Uh, we didn't run PCR. So from the side I said, I'm not going to do any PCR work. Um, but we, I mean, we do lots of screening in, uh, in, in antibodies and that's what we can do here as well. So we had, we were small, but we had to start thinking really big. Uh, all Netherlands, she wanted to have like a hundred campers running around or driving around to Netherlands. We never got to that size, but uh, uh, taking tests. But there was no time because, I mean, it's an epidemic. You have to do something right away. Uh, we couldn't have those groups because we knew that we wouldn't be able to collect blood anywhere, so we had to come up with something else. And of course, I also didn't want to risk uh, people working for me actually getting infected. So what we did in the end is we decided to work with a mobile lab, which is actually just a very fancy camper, uh, and we used existing rapid tests. There were a lot of people that thought that we developed those ourselves. If you are in a hurry and there's something on the market that you can use, you're not going to develop it yourself because that will take months. You simply buy what's there, evaluate which one's the best, and that's the way we, we dealt with. Of course, we also, I mean, we were with eight people. Uh, there's no way we could do that by ourselves. Uh, but we actually had some real talent. So our sales specialist, um, who is usually trying to target our customers, actually is a nurse by background. So she did our first finger pricks. Uh, the people that were used to work in a fancy lab in the, at the Pivot Park, they had to do it from a, a, from a camper. Uh, that worked as well. Uh, I had to go back in my uh, shape of actor rather than director of a company. Uh, so I spent lots of time talking to journalists. They always want the same thing. They always want to put you in that white coat that you never wear, but that's the way it should be. And actually, my friend Doreen, who has never worn a white coat, she even she had to put on a white coat. And at some point, she she really could give the talk just as well as I did. So, at some point, I started going back to running my business rather than uh, rather than giving uh, giving interviews. And we needed personnel. So, how do you get personnel? I mean, everybody knows it's tough to get well. But fortunately, or really bad for them, but fortunate for us, all the medical students. Uh, had to stop studying. I mean, anyone who was uh, in a hospital, they were all sent home, said, okay, you've got a study delay, but you can't do anything. So there were no classes, they couldn't work in hospitals, 
there were no temporary jobs because they were all working in restaurants and bars and everything closed so they didn't have anything so i started recruiting uh, medical students uh, later medical students so people with a little bit of experience and the top one luke is actually my son so he said uh, i'm going to arrange that for you mom so he called a couple of friends and then we had one of these temper agencies and at some point we had a really nice group of um, of students and we had also his girlfriend who actually ran our telephone uh, service because our office manager couldn't couldn't deal with that at all and my other son Jasper, who's a, a, an applied physics student who also had he actually had to come back from san diego but he took care of all the it business that was needed we recruited a few more and at some point point with a fixed group of eight people we actually had over 20 people um fortunately not all in our offices but running around in the netherlands and sometimes being in, uh, in our office and to be honest i mean at some point i thought are they really liking this because all i had to do is punch fingers and run tests but they, i think they had a time that they will never forget i mean sometimes they could go on a trip because then we wanted to do something in the north of the country you don't want to drive back to also all the time and uh, and they they become really really good in, uh, in in doing all of this um so i mean one of the issues was what kind of public private co collaborations can you get during corona of course from the end of march everyone could say only together we will actually be able to control corona uh, which is true so you need collaboration in that field between the public and the private sector i mean you've run into health hold issues i i've had some of those already a few years ago uh, we're still trying to get something done but it's i think it's really tough to really get that going at least beyond the state of uh, a public or a private company puts a lot of money in a public uh, institute then everybody's happy but if even if you actually want to get some of that money into your company that's really tough uh, but what we also needed i mean is we had a new program we weren't used to COVID. it's uh, notifiable disease so we needed to get some guidance from the rvm and so i reached out already middle of march like this is what you want to do uh, can we do this and i mean i don't know if only you can read it but this was their response Thank you for your email. It's great that you are going to do something uh, new, which actually wasn't the case. I had read what I said. And then they simply said that they didn't have the technical expertise to give me any feedback on our uh, program. Uh, so, of course, I said, okay, if you don't have the expertise, I do. So we just continued. But I mean, I was extremely surprised that within the RVM, I mean, that they weren't able to tell me that this was the stupidest idea of the world or that it was fantastic, but that I should pick different tests. They couldn't, so they really, I mean, we were small, we're trying to think big. They're very big, but they're small. And anyone who's seen uh, Arjan Lubach on last, last Sunday, uh, where he kept saying the microbiologist looking at the floor, that's the feeling that we had. I mean, it was really tough. Uh, I mean, I'm still, I won't say I'm fighting because I gave up, but, uh, it's really tough to get through that big concrete wall of uh, what we consider uh, our government. So it's, it's, this, it's almost division between companies and uh, the private uh, or the, the public sector. Um, so we, I, we simply went on. I mean, 14th of April we went live, and I can hardly imagine that that's just a couple of months ago. Uh, we got lots of publicity. Eén vandaag, NOS, nu.nl. Uh, uh, at some point, I, I said, I don't want to hear anything anymore. Um, because at some point, we also got a lot of negative feedback. Uh, GPs that thought it was completely irresponsible. And uh, it's always that heading, of course, because the rest of the thing was pretty positive. Uh, at the end, all publicity is actually good publicity because we had to push our limits. I mean, within I think, two or three weeks, we had 17,000 requests, which was no way that we could deal with that. Our emails maxed out, we had to switch. I mean, you, in Outlook, you can, I think you can send 100 emails a day or uh, not a day, uh, each, each time. Uh, usually if we send something out for 500, we do five times the same thing. With 17,000, there's just no way to do that. So we had to learn uh, about different emails uh, systems. 
uh, they almost took our website offline because they thought there was some bot uh, trying to reach us. We were unreachable by phone. Uh, at some point, I just couldn't hear the, the phone ringing. I just got crazy if that happened. We initially went in like a week from eight to 17 people. Uh, the mobile labs were everywhere in the country, so we needed the IT infrastructure to actually deal with that. And we needed, that was also interesting if you talk about public-private partnership, this was actually a very nice private-private partnership because we needed parking lots where you can do this and you can't do that at a public parking lot because then you have to ask for a permit first. There's no way you're going to get that within six months. So it's uh, so, so we actually, or, or my friend reached out to uh, companies she knew and like uh, car glass has been terrific that we had car glass locations all around the country um, where we could actually have a little train of about seven cars and then our uh, mobile lab. A uh, fond of all, like Neptunus uh, Structures is one of these big uh, companies that builds all these things for, for events and of course they didn't have any business as well. Uh, we even ended up with the Hangar in Kapwijk. Uh, so it was, I mean, this was really, really successful. And I mean, that was due to our regular team that initially was a little bit overwhelmed because we were doing all the stuff that they weren't used to. But then combined with the, uh, with the student team that became very quickly, very uh, independent. And one of the things that actually I had never realized, but I mean, we built over the years a very solid quality management team. Uh, well, quality management system and it, I mean we set this all up in one month and there would have been no way if we hadn't already built that quality management system because now we just have to say in a lot of the protocols rather than just having Q fever online we just added COVID and it all uh, we could apply to it so it's like all the pre uh, investigations and the, the reporting it was all a change of words but not uh, we didn't have to do anything really major uh, so that was one of the things and my quality manager uh, very quickly said this is going to be disaster so i'll take control of that mobile team otherwise they will never do it the way i want them to do it that worked really well as well she hasn't worked as hard as she did uh, for a long time so what was the output i mean we tested over 8500 people um, we had about 20 percent on average that was actually positive and we always, we had a concept where we said, if you're positive, we test you again in a lab test. So a, a classic one. So we don't get discussions about rapid tests that are not reliable. In many cases, we did actually more than one test per person uh, and got a terrific, that really got really interesting data out of that. I mean, we can show you what happens in the, in, in the entire Netherlands because we can simply select people based on the uh, on their uh, postcode and, uh, and see what happens there. For us as a company, it was really good cash flow because everything else we did actually died uh, mid-March, uh, but this uh, gave a pretty decent, uh, definitely decent revenues. Of course, we also spend a lot of money, so it's uh, it's still interesting to, to see. I'm still not clear whether how, how much revenue, how much real profit that uh, that cave might, but otherwise we probably wouldn't have survived uh, or we would have all been sitting out uh, uh, at home with an uh, subsidy. But this was a lot more fun and also a lot more useful looking at the fact that we actually have an epidemic. So we have the data. We know now how fast antibodies go down. We follow up with a couple of people to see what happens. Uh, we know what, what happens in different tests because they're Oh, people always think there's one one antibody test. No, there are mon uh, a number of them, and they all respond differently. And we actually spend a lot of time using the samples that we collected, also on evaluating new methods, um, different ELISAs, immunoblots that that actually came on the market. I mean, we didn't invent them, but other people did, and we decided what's good for for us. And the one that that I'm most uh, still most enthusiastic about, and we actually changed our whole concept really targeting on that one is uh, uh, a test that's called CPAS. It's, it's, it's marketed by GenScript and it's a uh, protein protein interaction. So what they actually measure is the interaction between part of the virus and the receptor on the human cell. So the ACE2 that you're probably targeting with your protease inhibitors. Um, so they built a very nice type of test things that I used to do with an organon as well works 
perfectly well, very sensitive, and the nice thing there, or the really important thing is that what we're measuring there is really the, the marker that, that means protection. Uh, if you look at general antibodies, they just stick anywhere at the virus, and that's what people always say, oh, we don't know if it's really protective. This is really targeting the bit that is important for protection. This is what we need from vaccines. And so we can now tell people, we have to be a little bit careful because RVM still thinks that we should say that, but we cannot just tell people that they have made antibodies, but they actually have the right antibodies to overcome the next wave. Because I mean, we're all worried about the economy, but I'm also really worried about people. And out of 2,500 and a little bit more today. So, uh, and this, this, this is something that can also be used, not just now, but also when we do get vaccinations, because then people get vaccinated and nobody knows yet how long that will take. So we'll have to start measuring and make sure that people are still infected. And the way we, we actually, so we're changing our concept from a, a rapid test and a, a follow-up ELISA now to going, okay, what do we do now? I and mean, we get a lot of requests for PCR and for antigen tests, and we'll probably move into the antigen test field, but that's all an acute impression. Do you have corona now? But when it's no, three days later, that story may be different. Uh, we really need to know for the long term is how are we going to survive it now and next year and the next wave? And if that's a, uh, if we get a vaccine, how long is that going to work? And so I still think that antibodies, T cells, B cells, really that's the stuff that will tell us whether we protect it or not and uh, the pcrs are just a way to monitor the infections now that's really something that from the start when we said i mean rvm really said we don't want to know we don't anyone to know whether they have antibodies because then they will change their behavior and will just sit with 100 people in the room um i think that nobody wants to get sick so it's nobody's that stupid but this is really the way uh, i think we should work and we shouldn't just just start on the the antigens or the the pcr we really have to see which people are protected or a little bit protected and so that's the question I, are we ready for that second wave i mean a week ago it wasn't there officially uh it was there a little bit now it's officially even there and i think that uh people I, and it's, it's, someone said uh for a vaccine we take a vaccine for protection of the whole community. To be honest, I don't. I would take a vaccine because I don't want to get sick. So that would be my primary objective what was, would be not to get sick. And if by not doing that, it would actually help other people, that's nice too. But, uh, and that's the same thing uh, with antibodies or with individual protection. Uh, maybe it doesn't help to protect your neighbor, but then it helps protect yourself. Uh, I think that's still a very good thing. Yeah, so the, the coming months, I think, won't be easy. They won't be easy business-wise for any of us. Um, but if you see how much knowledge is coming out, it's really like two key papers a, year, uh, a week, I think. Uh, I hope that if we use that, if we use our common sense, we will be able to survive the next six months. And after that, I hope that vaccine actually is there and is safe as well. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I think it's a great example of uh, entrepreneurship. You open for the business. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, compliments for the initiative. I think it's uh, it's very very uh, smart, very encouraging, and real entrepreneurship uh, as, a, as, a, as a good example. Uh, you talked a little bit about cash flow. I'm not asking you for the details, but I'm, I'm really curious. How did you organize your parallel funding on this initiative? I got a little bit of money for uh, buying uh, or a little bit of a loan from the bomb to, to actually buy kits in the beginning. And for the rest, we uh, we just ask people to pay first, and then get tested. 
So uh, we, we basically had the money in before we had to spend it on, uh, on other things. So we, we didn't, I mean, the whole thing uh, pretty much uh, funded itself, uh, except for that first investment in, uh, uh, in, in, in kits. So that's, uh, that's one of the nice things, if you can actually just sell something and, uh, and, uh, and, and yeah, send people an invoice. <laughs> and then, of course, they have to pay. So initially, we didn't have that rightly coupled. That was complicated because you have to figure out who has paid in the West. And at some point, we simply said, OK, you pay first, and then you, uh, uh, then you can make an appointment. Uh, and that's, that works. And then they, they paid that to the moment of trip or just before? no before when they when people signed up. I mean we had all online appointments and uh, uh, when they when they scheduled an appointment uh, they had to pay at the same time. They had to fill in a little questionnaire with their medical history and then uh, at the end uh, the system said now you have to pay and that's uh, so that's the the, the main way of uh, finding something like this. All right. Anybody else? And I have to say that entrepreneurship, if that friend of mine hadn't just told me, you have to do this, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have dared. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's always a combination. It's good to have that, uh, that reflection of uh, not wanting to know everything and not wanting to, there's always this tendency that you want to be sure about everything. You can't be sure at this time. You just have to take the risk and do it. One more question. Well, I think life will be pretty boring for you if, if this is all over, because it seems like an exciting time right now. Um, and I'm wondering, what did you learn for your Q fever and um, Lyme disease from the experience you had during this, this period? Did you change something? Did you have some new insights? Yeah, the, the, the thing that we have is, we, for, for example, for Lyme disease, we're running a screening program that is expanding every year. So we started with 100 people, then we came to 150, then we had uh, 500. That I, but that program actually now has 3,500 people in it, and that should, I mean, double or at least 50% extra every year. That's what we're aiming for. Uh, but we get stuck because we want to do that all between the middle of October and let's say the middle of January. Uh, that's easy if you have 100, but if you have uh, 3,500 and then you want to increase that to 5,000. Uh, everyone's stressed out and this really forced us to automate so we've uh, actually we've and that's also the good thing if you make some money some extra money uh, so we bought a perpetuating machine and we actually uh, automated all our reporting so we used to do that sort of semi-automatic but still with a lot of manual thing it's now all and and, and I mean I wouldn't be, have been able to do this without automation um, but now we can actually use that also for, for Lyme. And for, for Q fever, yeah, that has very much turned into research for us. We actually were involved in, in vaccine development for Q fever, which the interesting bit is that we do that with, uh, with Oxford University, with the same group that is now uh, one of the front runners in, uh, uh, in the COVID vaccines, but they never tell us. They even don't tell their own employees how things are going. So uh, we don't really get, uh, get any information there. It's, uh, but it's 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 nice to see that that same group is uh, is front runner right here. Great. Well, Anya, thank you very much. We're going to take a little break while we make the setup for the panel discussion. The back of the bank. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have some time for a uh, discussion. I will open up some questions. Of course, it's open to react to each other and uh, ask questions. There might be questions in the audience also. So, uh, for the only have two mics, so we'll be running around with the mics. If necessary. Uh, so we're, I think we have uh, great stories. Some of them, uh, they, let's say, really start with science and get to business. Other ones say, hey, we have a business. Ah, oh, what's happening now? What are we going to do? And the first thing I would, would like to get uh, uh, with you is uh, if, you, if you look back to the, the last months, uh, 
what have been, uh, let's say, uh, first learnings from uh, from the work that you have done, or would maybe you want to do more in work, work and you are not able to do it because of uh, various reasons. So, first, I would like to ask Anya. So, what's the learnings? Yeah, at some point you don't, uh, in particular in a pandemic, uh, trying to get everything to 100%, uh, don't do that. Just go for it and then you may stumble along the way. Uh, I mean, we've been declared a menace to public health uh, uh, for, uh, in a couple of cases, but uh, and you just have to be yeah, that, that elephant that, that doesn't care if that happens. I just know that you're good and that what you're doing is okay. Yeah. yeah, I guess for, for us, the learnings were, um, you know, going back to, to Ninka's question as well, like uh, mm -hmm. our business developments suffered. We couldn't fly anymore, we couldn't go anywhere, we couldn't go to conferences, mm -hmm. and then the COVID opportunity arose, and we, we thought we, we, got, we have some good technologies, and we started doing cold calling, which we've never done before, mm -hmm. sending out emails to CEOs, and it utterly, utterly did not work. They did not know us, uh, the relationships weren't there. And so we, we flipped that around and we actually spent quite a bit of money on marketing. And then not just a little bit of, hey, we scientists can create a marketing story. No, we actually hired marketeers, we hired an external marketing uh, bureau, uh, spent significant money on that. And we started blasting that out on, on LinkedIn, on webinars. Uh, we started, I mean, I, I've done the same presentation for a series of reporters and uh, journalists in the United States and the big newspapers, Wall Street Journal and things like that. And, and so that's actually got a lot of traction. Then all of a sudden we got approached. Now the other thing we did was uh, going uh, with, with the Gates Foundation, who was COVID Accelerator, for us to say, oh yeah, no, we work with Gates. Oh yeah, no, we work with all the big ones. You know, that you, you create this aura and spending our time on marketing instead of flying instead of going to the conferences actually has made us go into that initially we filmed as well we got zero responses in the beginning i remember sending out 35 emails to ceos and not a, not a single response um, and i think that's the part you change your business and, and you apply your money in a different way you also have to realize that if you've got the means to say you know this is not the way i do business development i'm not a marketeer i need some help here and that helps I recognize the travel part because we, we have customers all over the world and normally I fly to Barcelona just for a two hour meeting with a uh, surgeon and fly back the next day and what you see now is that um, instead of doing that you have a two hour meeting which is still two hours but you, uh, you win one day so actually you can do more in the same time. Uh, it's good to see people of course and clients face to face. So I think this will still continue, but I think the doing business has changed. Yeah. I think that's also a message that we have received. Um, <clears throat> I think for our uh, side, from the InfoSLSP side, from uh, the instrument development uh, uh, side, what you, what the main learnings were that you are actually used to a certain standard of uh, how things uh, can be done. And uh, even in our former lives as uh, scientists and project leaders, uh, we have seen a few times that if there's a lot of urgency, you can speed up a lot. But at a certain stage, you, you know, it, it seems that you are still used to the normal stuff, how it normally goes. And uh, in our business, like the extreme acceleration of uh, introducing a, a new technology in a new environment without even being there, uh, it was a year ago, we would call you extremely stupid if you would come up with that idea. But I think in a, in a real crisis, uh, it's, it's much better to uh, force yourself to come from the other side and uh, start with, let's do it totally different and just up to the moment where you actually cannot do anything else. And uh, then you will see that you can indeed do a lot more than you think. Do you still uh, anything to add to that? I'm mm, sure. Well, I think most has been said. What we, what we definitely learned is all the ins and outs of Zoom and, um, and Microsoft Teams. <laughs> um, but also we, 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 well, we knew that, but now 
how it has been exemplified that our staff is very flexible in, in uh, putting in the time that I saw uh, similar stories here today. Um, and also, you have to, well, it's a confirmation of many things. You have to be persistent in, um, in getting things done and be the elephant in the, in the uh, porcelain closet. Just do it. Um, similar here, we, we, with the help Holland, if I had looked upon some of the comments initially, don't do it or it's a waste of time, etc. If we wouldn't have done it, we would not have had these results yet. So, uh, to, to stay with to stay with you, Bert, because you're you're at a certain stage now. So, what what are the real needs to uh, to continue the work and, and to get successful? The long story or the short one? Well, um, <laughs> well this is short. Um, we have some compounds that are really promising um, in terms of preclinical efficacy. And we need to get, but we don't have money for that. So that's the first need is really uh, more money to, to be able to perform those studies. Um, and, and what we would like is really to expand this to um, other potentially um, viral diseases that can come up. But uh, well, maybe one other thing what we have learned mm -hmm. also is, is um, um, we started out to work on therapeutics and with, 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 the, with the mechanism of action that we that we use, we know that and that's not an ultimate solution. But in this um, outbreak, when the vaccine is not yet present, you can uh, really manage an outbreak if you have um, a therapeutic working on the virus and use it basically as a preventive tool or a prophylactic. And uh, I think if that would have been present, as uh, people like Johan Knights, Asta House. Uh, Snyder already stated many times, if you have them at hand when something arises like this, you don't have this mess that we're currently in now. I wouldn't have to wear this glove. <laughs> that suits you well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and for you, Anya, if you look to the future, what's the next step? What's, what's going to be needed in addition to a little bit of entrepreneurship? Uh, I think that we... Uh need a lot more collaboration and really use expertise from everybody and that's therapeutics and that it's vaccine development and it's diagnostics and that that total concept of how do you deal with covid is is not there it's not there worldwide everybody has its little piece there are hundreds of companies chasing a vaccine whereas i think okay uh, there are a couple of front runners you may need uh, two or three that actually cover up and why do we need more than 100? That's just people, everybody thinks I won't get rich. Uh, and really understanding what we need to do is, is important. And again, I think that you're completely right. It's not just at the start of an epidemic that you need. So, so what we need is that total concept. And I think that when people really work together, we would get that out there. And, and I see too much internal competition. I see still that fragmented, we, the microbiologists, know everything, and everybody else is a dirty company, and they probably just want to make money. Um, and I, I, it would be really good if we get rid of that, because otherwise we won't get rid of, of Corona. I think that we'll be meeting like this for the next three years, and I don't want to do that. I'd really like to have that differently. Um, and everybody thinks that they have one solution, there's not one. Yeah, so I think I, yeah, you made some really good comments about, I think, the touch environment as well. And, and the sort of, I, I watch that and I think of something like, please, can we expand our vision a little bit, collaborate a little bit more? Um, I think some of the macro trends are very interesting. So um, if you look at tobacco industry, oil industry, pharmaceutical industry, that's sort of the three villains in that order. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this year is for the first time demonstrating back to the general population of the world, pharma industry is probably not your worst enemy, you probably need them. Um, that has some positive benefits. That actually means more funding flows into us. That means we can do more. Um, I think one of the downsides is that with any uh, of these epidemics, um, if it's not urgent, we're not going to invest in it. We're all going to forget about uh, these infectious diseases again. The Dutch may build their dikes so that we don't get flooded every 10,000 years, but pretty much all the time it goes back to forgetting about this. That is a risk, but I do think there is a undercurrent now of people saying, 
maybe we should raise the tax, maybe we should be ready for these events, it will come back. And I think that's that's the thing we need to jump on uh, and, and, and build these platforms. Yeah, I think so. I think that's, that's a turning page. So uh, the fact that, yeah, there's pharma companies making money, I'm sorry, I think pretty much everybody has a mortgage to pay, um, even if you're a microbiologist in, uh, at, at an academic hospital. So the fact that there is more positive attention, more funding is a positive thing. I think we need to have that vision to, to build these platforms to go forward. And also, one thing I would argue as well, like please get ourselves out of the Netherlands with our thinking. Um, it, there is there's so many connections to make across the world. And, and yes, you need introductions and yes, you need a network. Let's work on that together. And, and I think even now today, there's a few opportunities that, that are crossing our minds and I think that's very positive. So yeah, uh, I think there's, there's, there's gonna be some downsides as we lose attention, but there's actually more opportunity going forward. Christian, anything to add? What was the question? What do you need? Okay. Uh, my, my best part on it also, she is, uh, she's talking to a lot of organizations about reshoring. We uh, impregnate products with vancomycin, and tobromycin, and other antibiotics. And these all come from China. And uh, well, normally the, the lead time of delivery is two weeks. Um, and last week we have received an order that we placed in January. So this is, this is ridiculous, of course. So I hope that as, as Holland, uh, as the Netherlands, we, we fade more, uh, have to fade to ourselves. Make sure that we can do the things ourselves, which we could 30 years ago, but we stopped all the vaccine developments and all the, the, the antibiotic productions and everything else, and everything moved to, uh, to Asia. Uh, but I hope that this is a signal that um, it's better to, to spend a bit more money ourselves in the house to instead of outsourcing it in these situations. Thank you. Do you see for the future, let's say, from the learning from this, preparing as uh, we're told it's going to be new, another epidemiology ep epidemic anyhow. So any things you say, okay, but next time I'm going to take from this play on that one. Um, well, certainly we have learned a lot for uh, for the future. And I have to say, if there is a next epidemic happening, we already have our remote procedures available. So, in that sense, we are prepared. But uh, let's hope, of course, that it's much better under control than, uh, than, it, than it is right now. But uh, for us as a company, we are, of course, in a niche market in, in, in process analytics. Uh, and. Uh, there is a difference that there is much more attention now in the vaccine area of applications, uh, besides the oncology, which was already uh, available, and uh, some other application areas. So for, let's say, the upcoming period and the, uh, the I think, increased attention for vaccine development and everything related to nanoparticle vehicles in uh, nanomedicine, uh, uh, we will benefit also from this uh, crisis in having a few stories about vaccine development that will help us, of course, to get the technology further on the road and will help us as a company. Yeah. Shall we do one uh, final qu uh, question with yeah. a very short answer, probably? What are you most proud of? I say of the team, of course. My mother. <laughs> uh, now I'm. Uh, I'm absolutely uh, very, very proud of that. that uh, the, the, let's say the, the full mindset, as I explained, and maybe it's not easy to do it in five minutes in a presentation, but if you come from a complex, stupid idea to do things that you are actually not available on the site to uh, install and install an application and make it work, that, uh, that the mindset of the entire team was ready to uh, let that go and actually go for it. That, that there is no no one uh, telling you or annoying you that uh, keeping you uh, uh, busy with it's not possible, but everyone said, well, you just go for it. And if it, of course, is successful in the end, then it's something to be really proud of, I guess. No. Yeah, I think that that sort of internal team spirit is something we, we build up quite a bit as well. Uh, we, we started out by saying to ourselves, you know, never waste a good crisis to then say, this is our birthright. This is what we do. This is why we actually end up in this place providing this sort of services to power companies to do research and development. And to be at that place where you could actually make a difference, 
is, is something, you know, we talked about marketing to the outside, but actually this is the internal market for, for everybody to not say, oh, we're never going to get through this or what's going to happen on, on certain. Uh, we, we, we spend quite a bit of time with that, with, with the internal teams uh, uh, messaging that. Um, but I found in, in, in other countries like the United States, people were very worried about their job as well. And, and so we started over communicating all our finances internally as well. Like, hey guys, we're okay. We're going to be fine. Oh, by the way, your bonus, you're going to get that. No worries. And that was at the time where about 26 million people lost their job in a week's time over there. So I think keeping that team spirit going and, and sort of infusing yourself with this new mission, that really has helped. And then the funny part is if I look at so from a revenue perspective, what the little gains, it wasn't COVID. It was the, the total team running on all cylinders and all those other things that actually, you know, made us progress more than we thought we were going to. Uh, and I think that's, um, yeah, I would definitely think that for the future as well. I think, Anya, you said it as well, like just going in, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to have zero responses when you're doing this is development drive initially and get those latest. Because you walk out of that thinking, okay, next time I'm going to do that again. And you'll learn a lot. And, and yeah, you move the whole team to a new level. And what we then also do is take time to celebrate that. Let's discuss that again. Like look back over our shoulder, like, wow, an eventful year, but that's positive. No well, I think at one point we also said like we like to do social events and things together, but it has to be remote. And please let it not be another Zoom meeting. Uh, it is in <laughs> Yeah, we, we used the warm weather during the summer to have a, some kind of company celebration outside, two meters from each other, with small swimming pool in the middle where we could put feet in. Uh, but it, it, it's indeed the team, the people who are working already dealt with the situation. We've got a student who lives in Apeldoorn and she didn't want to travel by uh, public transport in the train. And we can understand it. But we did a great effort with the team to already dealt with the situation. We have laboratories, clean rooms, so people are used to work in, in let's say, fully dressed up. Um, and we are going to be, the, I think, the only company in the world who has uh, later on this year issued some license, ISO 3485, as well as a GMP license. So I think that's going to be the thing I'm going to be most proud of. Yeah. I think that, uh, that I'm really proud of, of that, we, that we actually got done and uh, nobody broke down and we actually make money and we're still uh, going back to our live screening now and uh, just uh, would, yeah so I think it's uh, it's and that's that's everything together so it's great yeah, proud. Yeah, I'm not going to repeat you guys, but it's it's mainly the it's the team and how what we could accomplish in a really short time and uh, and a fresh. Yeah. All right. Any, anybody else that wants to add something? Audience remarks, suggestions. What was it? Thanks, John. Um, I was wondering, um, you all dealt with all kinds of problems. Um, there is a whole infrastructure in the Netherlands and several ecosystems. Um, and I was wondering, um, did you find uh, did you find collaboration well? Could you find your partners well? Um, uh, yeah, that was my question. I, just in general. Or was it just, or was it hard to find them? Uh, for us, um, it was not hard to find them because we knew them already. Um, actually, one of our upper name was uh, from Avivia, which is very close in the ecosystem as uh, the neighbors of them. I think I knew most of the panelists here already. Um, what was a challenge, is because we were, this was in the first wave, uh, when we tried to set up this, this um, health home collaboration is to get all the virologists because they were on 24 7 shifts and um, so we really had to get them out of the out of the lab almost literally to answer the phone to us and um, well it took some it took some uh, time to get that done and I had to invoke some other um, I call it uh, acquaintances Kenneth, to uh, to get that going but that was the main thing but the, the parties we uh, most of them we knew already Anybody else wants to comment on the part? 
So I sometimes think that maybe we could leverage a little bit more. Um, and then you know, I'll, I'll talk for Satara. We quite frankly have most of our clients outside of the Netherlands. We are also a global company. And so, yeah, we, we, we got offices in, in Austin, Breda and, and, and in Amsterdam, but it's, it, it's a more generalized focus. I am sometimes surprised to see the work that's going on here and the, the, the searching for funding while I'm thinking, yeah, so we operate in this world of private equity and these very large companies. We're still not adding one on one together there. And, and it's one of the reasons why I'm here as well, because I do think it's important that we start connecting that a little more. So maybe just a sort of formalization um, of, there seems to be a lot of collaboration between the companies that are seeking money, talking to each other, which is not particularly helpful. And then the money, the companies, company I'm in that are not seeking for those types of things we're sort of isolated we, we show up at the life sciences park and also but do we really contribute enough there so there's a critical note to myself um, and a reason why I'm here as well I think there, there is an opportunity there and I think at the end of the day um, yes we want to promote the Netherlands and how we're growing and, and onshoring is a solution but I also sometimes think it gets in our way of thinking a little bit bigger like it all always has to happen over here. It always has to happen through these usual networks. Go out there, build your network beyond the Netherlands. That will strengthen the Netherlands. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I think we come to an end of uh, this small discussion and this meeting. First of all, I uh, want to thank uh, all the presenters for the great, great pieces of uh, work that has been done. Thanking all of you being here, not to forget the people at home. I hope they are still there and making a lot of notes. So maybe see you in the future over here. And of course, I want to thank uh, the people from Pivot Park and from Health Valley, our back office that has been working the whole time to keep things running. Well, I hope to see you back in the near future. Bye.